All right, I believe, although I'm getting an error message, I believe that we are live. We want to give you just a few seconds to come on and invite a few people to join with you. So this is your opportunity, as we always say, to be a virtual evangelist and like and share and invite someone who would like to hear a word from the Lord. And when we say that, we want you to know that this is an actual form of Bible study. Although it's not a sitting and opening and pulling out an actual scripture, it is the word in real form. It is the word where people have actually lived by godly principles and flourished. That's our word for this evening. We will have an amazing conversation with an amazing guest, and we'll talk about that just a little bit later. That's two amazings within 10 seconds. Um, Kai, Kyle, and Robert Johnson. That's two in two seconds. So I'm really, really on my A game tonight. I want to just give just a few announcements, and I'll bring Pastor Johnson on for this. If you guys have missed him as much as I have, you will be excited to see his face on the screen. He is um, refueled and on fire. Dotting I's, crossing T's, casting <laughs> vision, getting things in order, doing what he does best. So we are so glad to have you back, sir. Um, the rate you're going, you're gonna need another sabbatical by the end of the week. Yeah, I am. I am pushing, but it's good to be back. Good evening, everyone. Thank you all for tuning in. And but it is good to be back. And I I have jumped in uh uh, uh from 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 toe to head. I've just fully immersed myself back into the life of St. Mark into ministry. We've got a lot going on. We've got a, a lot of some announcements that maybe we can do some of those on the front end as folks are coming on. Those of you that are on, thank you for coming on. And if you'll reach out and uh, share this broadcast to your page, invite some folks to come on. St. Mark leaders that we especially wanted to be a part of this conversation tonight. Uh, thank you for coming on and make sure you reach out and, and uh, connect with someone. Hey, mom. Good evening. Love you. Love Hello, you. Hello, Evangelist Johnson. How are you? Hello, mom. Hello. Hello, uh, Mr. Mr. Oaks. My mom came on. I know she's looking forward to hearing from you. I've been telling her about you. She's a woman of great faith and raised five wonderful kids. Well, four wonderful four. kids plus me. <laughs> And uh, but she is she is uh, on to hear you. So, mom, thank you for coming on. So if you're watching, make sure you tag some folks, invite them to come on. Uh, I am so excited about this conversation. Uh, I'm just at a place, Yolanda, in my life, in my journey as a person and as a pastor that uh, I just want to. Exp- and I'm at the right place to say this. St. Mark calls itself this. It's been its logo slogan for 30 years, the place of possibilities and transformation. And I'm at a place now, I'm really ready to explore got new possibilities in God, to uh, to take the limit restrictions off, to take the barriers off that I've placed on myself and placed on others and really explore fully what it means to be God's people. So I'm really excited to be back. We've got, everything has changed, Yolanda, everything. That sounds like an excerpt from a book I've read recently. You know anything about that book? I don't know anything about that book. Well, well I've read an awesome book. It's probably on, I was telling them earlier, I've got books all over the place. Jesus Unchained by our own Pastor Johnson. That's one of our announcements. That's one of our ways that you can actually get connected, not just um, with the word, but with yourself. You can purchase it on Invite Resources and on Amazon, Jesus Unchained by Robert G. Johnson. So I'm sorry to interrupt you, but you won't give your own plugs. He pays me for each time that I say it. Just want to get that out front and personal. So go ahead. You're just out of place then. Hey, well, thank thank you for sharing that. And we do want people to get the book. We're going to have a couple of virtual and in-person options for people to read the book together, study it together. We're looking forward to that. But what I was about to say was that we're living in a time where everything has changed. And, And for the church, what I've been saying to, I said this to my staff today, I've been saying this to our leaders, that Jesus didn't say, Kyle, uh, in Matthew chapter 28, all power on in, in heaven and on earth is in my hand. Now, therefore, go build church buildings and wait for people to come. And if they come, then make disciples. 
he said, go into all the world, which means to me, go where people are. And for 2000 years, almost, we've kind of disobeyed that command. We've said, no, we don't want to do it that way. We're going to be a church buildings and, and make them so attractive. People will want to come to them. And COVID has just kind of disrupted that for 90% of churches in this country. And now we, I, but I'm excited because Yolanda, this, now we get to really live into the kingdom because now we have to go take the church to the people and not wait for people to come to church. We have to go be the church with people. I know Kai loves it because Kai, even like, even before, like when COVID first hit, before we know, knew it was going to be three years, Kai was already saying, Hey, let's preach one sermon a month and go live it for three weeks. <laughs> preach one sermon, preach one sermon. And then the other three weeks of the month, let's go live it. Let's go do it. And then come back together and say, what did we learn? And so that's by taking the church out of the building and into the to the place where people are living. So these are exciting times. And we've got somebody on tonight that I think is going to pour into us and help us to think bigger than we than what we thought about what it means means to be God's people. Can I share just a couple of other announcements on tomorrow? All leaders and all seniors, if, even if you are not a senior of St. Mark, tomorrow at 12 p.m., we're we're restarting our seniors fellowship. It's going to we're going to start online uh, by uh, by Zoom. And at that Zoom meeting tomorrow, we will plan what we, how we whether we want to come back in person or continue online. We'll have that link ready to put up before we end tonight. Uh, and then on Sunday, the, the next two Sundays, Invite a Friend Sunday. And of course, this Invite a Friend Sunday is also fan day. We're encouraging you to wear the paraphernalia, wear the clothing of your favorite sports team on any level, whether that's high school level, college level, professional level. We're just trying to have some fun. And then tomorrow at 6 p.m., we're doing a, another life groups training. We're inviting people to start life groups. This is different from the model you all have heard, heard about before. We're inviting you to whatever you do that's fun and healthy to invite other people into it. And then we will equip you and train you of how to turn that into opportunities to connect people with, with, with Jesus. OK, so there's another training at 6 p.m. tomorrow. If you're interested, you all know my phone number. Most of you all you got my you can find me on Facebook, inbox me, shoot me a, a note to ask me for the link and I'll send it to you and you can be a part of that training. All right, let's bring on our rest of our co-hosts before I talk too much, and then we'll bring on our guests for tonight. You want to introduce Kai and Kyle? Yes, so let's start out with Pastor Kyle Kacklemeyer. How are you? I'm good, if I can unmute myself. Um, I'm Never doing well here. from my toe to my head. That's what I'm doing. <laughs> That's absolutely right. Um, things are things are busy in my household, but um, yeah, enjoying life and um, glad to be here. Last quarter of the year, I think people are beginning to feel a little bit of pressure all the way around work life, home life, all the way around. Yeah. So I think a lot of people will be able to relate to that. And then we'll bring on the um, young man who would love someone to wear a Dallas Cowboy jersey shirt, much to Pastor Johnson's chagrin, <laughs> uh, for fan day. So, Brother Kai, how are you? I'm I'm just I'm blessed from my toe to my <laughs> head. <laughs> you know, just I mean, what can I say? I mean, we've already had dry humor tonight, which I was over here really cracking up. <laughs> I thank you, thank you, Pastor Kyle. Uh, Robert's over here. I, I, Robert's over here getting stuff backwards and in between. We got a wonderful guest on today that's going to balance out all of our silliness. So that's wonderful. Pastor Yo is just holding it down. Being, what is going on? Are you okay, Robert? Oh my gosh, you can't. Okay, Pastor Yo's holding it down like always, calm, steady. You know, and the rest of us are just causing a ruckus. So I'm happy. I'm ready to go. And then lastly, I i don't know if y'all saw it in the comments, you know what I'm saying? But I got my own shout out from Mama Johnson. So I know I'm her new favorite. Bye, Robert. Not Robert, Robert. Bye, Robert. 
well, then you're going to need to start logging on to her um, Bible studies. I, I may not be able to log on every week live. I do <laughs> watch every week, though. So I'm just saying, Mother Johnson, keep doing what you're doing. Keep up the good work. Any other updates that anyone may want to add on tonight? Do any of you have anything that you want to share on the front end or we'll catch up with everything on the back end and then I get the opportunity. I have the privilege. Ooh. So I Googled him, right? Because I was skeptical after I heard all of the beautiful things about Mr. Pete Oaks. I mean, you know, you, there are times, especially in this day and age, no one really, really passes the smell test. But no matter how far I dug, right, even after meeting him virtually and hearing some of the things that he's had to say about what he's done and how his own ministry has affected the world and um, the marginalized, the impoverished, the imprisoned, I still wasn't a believer. And Pastor Johnson was gung-ho, and I was like, still a skeptic. But I tell you, no matter what rock I've turned over, no matter what research that I've actually done, the philanthropic effort of this man and his family goes far and wide. On our advertising flyer, it says that he is a global entrepreneur and businessman, but deep at his heart, he is a lover of Christ, and it oozes from every portion of his body. With that said, we'll let him come on and tell us a little bit about himself and how he loves living life. If you'll put your hands together, if you were in the building, I'd have you stand up on your feet to, to greet and welcome the Mr. P. Oaks. Well, Yolanda, thank you so much. Does Missouri count as like global? <laughs> yeah, if, if yeah, if Missouri counts, I'm global. You betcha. <laughs> well, it, it's, re it's really great to be here. And uh it's my pleasure. I'm, I'm humbled to be able to visit with you all. Absolutely. It's a pleasure to have you on. I, I want to, as, as we as we ask you this first question, how are you doing? I share so, a few details about uh, Pete. He's the founder and chairman of Capital 3, an impact investment company with investments in the U.S. and Central America. Uh, over the past last 40 years, Capital 3 has stewarded companies in the energy, manufacturing, and service sectors, frequently focusing on places devoid of human flourishing, such as prisons and poverty-stricken countries. Powerful. Pete's passion in life is to educate, equip, and empower business leaders worldwide to live for something greater than themselves by using that business platform to impact the world for Christ. Wow. To further this end, Pete has written two books, High Impact Life and High Impact Business, providing a personal and business transformation framework. Pete lives by four simple principles, honor God, serve people, pursue excellence, and steward capital. For all the St. Mark leaders, let's, let me, let, let's do that, honor God, serve the people, pursue excellence, and steward capital. These four simple but powerful principles, when brought to bear, create economic, social, and spiritual capital, resulting in high-impact lives and businesses. Peter and his wife have been married for over four decades. They have two children and nine grandchildren. And that's out. What an absolutely amazing bio and statement. I love what you're doing and how you've turned this this focus on using business as a platform to create flourishing. Pete, welcome. Thank you so much for coming on. And uh, I, let's start here. How are you doing? Yolanda and I had the chance to meet you. Has it been like a, maybe back in the spring, early, yes. early part of 2020? Yes, at the beginning of 2020, we had as our first meeting with you uh, virtually. Yes. Uh, thank you for coming on. How are you? What, what are you working on right now? And what has you most excited about life? Yeah, um, I'm doing well, other than uh, a couple of months ago, I was out hiking in Colorado and I stumbled over Boulder. And the next thing you know, I had a massive hamstring tear. So mm. I've been kind of gimping around. But other than that, uh, life is really good. Um, I think the thing I'm most excited about is 
you know, I'm an entrepreneur. So anytime uh, I see movement in business and particularly um, I've seen this in the last four or five years, I really see a movement across the country of business people who are saying um, business and faith should not be bifurcated. They're one. They should be one and the same and they should work off the same platform. And the growth in that movement is astounding. And I'm just really excited and uh, I want to be a part of that however I can be. Wow. Wow. So so we we mapped out this conversation. We try to map out our conversations uh, on Wednesdays, but I, I know that I'm I'm going to, this was not one of our questions, but I, I, I just, I want to, I want to take a moment and I, I want to jump right into this, Pete. I want to, I'd like for you to just quickly, and then we'll move to the other questions. I don't know who has, this, whoever has the next question after me, but I, I'd like for you to talk a moment about these, those four things, honor God, serve people, pursue excellence, and steward capital. So I want, if you talk about those four things, but the other things you talked about how businesses, people think that you can't merge business and faith, but but that you're doing, that you intend to do that, you're doing that, and you're seeing that doing it, you're seeing that being done. Twist that and talk about people of faith who don't think that uh, created business uh, practice can be merged with faith. Talk yes. about that. So, yeah. Exactly. So I'm a framework guy. I love frameworks. And we have a framework. And um, the saying is this, principles define people, Pr uh, people determine practices, and practices drive performance. Okay. Wow. So if wow. something if something's wrong in the church or something's wrong in your business, you have a performance problem. It's the practices are wrong. And then when you look at the practices, it's probably the people are something's not happening there. And the reason the people aren't doing things right is because they don't understand the principles of the organization. So wow. if you if you think about it in any organization, there are four things that really those are what the the, the four P's. Principles, people, practices, and performance are what we call the drivers of business or of church or of your life. So everything starts with principles. And because there are four things that we have to deal with, um, those four principles, honor God has to do with the principles of your life. Ser uh, serving people have to do with the people in your life. The pursuit of excellence has to, that's the way you should do your practices and um, being a good steward is how you should perform. So everything we do is driven by those four, those four uh, P's as we call them. Wow. I, I want to pause right here and see if Kai, Kyle or Yolanda want to, I know that Yolanda is like, mm -hmm. is I'm, like. I'm not walking into that one, Pastor. Oh my, oh. <laughs> I'm not walking. I totally agree with you. So, Pete, you said it begins with the people when something's when the organization is not functioning well, it begins with bad practices. Actually, it's um, it's principles, people, practices, and then performance. Okay, performance is the last thing you do. It's it's what creates. Um, more Christians, more money, more relationships, okay? So if your performance is not up to par, it's because your practices are, something's wrong with your practices. And if your practices are are not doing things, are not do, doing well, it's because your people don't want, know how to do them. And so if the, the four values that we just said, honor God, serve people, pursue excellence, and be a good steward, steward things, we, those are the principles, the people part of that. Uh, we have what we call the four C's. You're going to, you're going to, by the end of the show. This. We're loving it. We're, and my wife is loving it. She's a, she's a framework and, and, and so keep going. Yes. Yes. So, so character is the people virtue that is a result of honoring God. Um, connection is the, it takes connection to serve people, right? You've got to connect with them. 
And if you're going to be excellent, you have to be competent, the third C. And if you're going to be a good steward, you have to be committed. So while the four values are honor God, serve people, pursue excellence, be a good steward, the people parts of that are character, connection, competence, and commitment. Wow. Mm-hmm. Wow. Kai, jump in. Kyle, y'all yeah. jump in. Jump in. Well, so I, uh, I want to I want to address something you said earlier. So, you know, you made this comment about how uh, businesses are looking to integrate faith more into what they're doing. Uh, a lot of us that are in that circle, you know, we know that there's always been this: you don't do religion at work, you don't do faith at work. Like we work to separate those. But you said they're coming together. So my first question is: what do you believe is driving businesses to integrate faith? Mm-hmm. Like what's what's changed? Yes. So I think it really. I think this whole thing with faith coming into businesses is a result of the secular business world talking about people, profit and people, planet and profit, the triple bottom line. OK, uh, we're now into environment, uh, government and social ESG environmental, social, and governmental, okay? Yep. Uh, people, planet, and profit. So 25 years ago, that was coming into vogue. And I said, well, I don't, I don't uh, disagree with any of those. I think they're terrific. But where are the principles that drive people, planet, and profit? They're, they're leaving out the fourth P, principles. Mm. So what I said, well, let's take the environmental piece and that push, let's push that into... Um, the, the social piece. So uh, profit is what we call economic capital, um, relationships with each other and relationships with our environment is social capital and the principles are spiritual capital. Excellent. And so um, if you are going to flourish, if we can talk about flourishing for a minute, um, you, can't, you have to have all three of those to flourish. And I think those come from Genesis 2, 15 through 18. In Genesis 2, 15, it says, God put man in the garden to work. And guess what happens when you work? You're going to have material provisions. You're going to have economic capital. Verse 18, not good for man to be alone. We need relationships, social capital. And last, don't eat the fruit of that tree, verse 16, 17. And that's the first time I think God gave us a moral code, a, a command Mm-hmm. To, uh, and that's spiritual capital. And of course, for those of us who are followers of Christ, that means a, a personal relationship with him and an adherence to God's word. So I think it's those economic, social and spiritual capital. You can have all, uh, you know, you can have you can have a lot of friends love Jesus. And if you don't have food to eat, you're not flourishing. Mm-hmm. You can have all the money in the world, all the friends in the world, but no Jesus and Ugh, you're not flourishing. Mm. What's happened, I think, in society, because we've taken Jesus and God out of the equation, there is no spiritual capital anymore. Mm. What happens is when you take God, a moral code, out of society, it creates a moral vacuum. God created this world for morality. And when you take that out, it creates a moral vacuum. That has to get still filled with something. And oftentimes, G-O-D, God, gets replaced with G-O-V, government, more rules, more regulations, and we ultimately lose our freedom, our Mm -hmm. spiritual freedom, our social freedom, etc. So Mm -hmm. this spiritual capital piece is really, really important. 100%. So quick, quick, (laughs) to, to, it's so interesting to hear you say this. So I do DEI work, but I work hand in hand with ESG. And one of the things I've been talking to corporations about, particularly are the DEI leaders, because I had a faith background and ended up in DEI. And I said, well, the problem is your company has core values, but it doesn't have a greater framework. It doesn't have a moral compass. Your your company cannot act as a moral or ethical uh, authority. And they go, well, Kyron, well, how are you having success? I said, well, I'm talking with your employees. I'm discerning their faith tradition, be it whatever it is. And now I'm tying (laughs) these values, right, in a framework that actually has weight to them, to the employee, right? And so ultimately what I hear you saying is, and this is the point I wanted to get to, is that (laughs) 
we need as Christians, what you're talking about to me sounds like rediscovering the liturgy of our lives. Right. And what I mean yeah. by that is that worship is not something we do on Sunday, but every part of what we do is now an act of worship. And if it's an act of worship, just as you what you laid out is basically Christian formation. Right. Yeah. <laughs> the principles, the people, the practice, the performance. Right. And so yeah. what you're talking about is is a. I'm happy to hear somebody else out there making that argument, but you're laying it out so well. So I just wanted to say thank you for that. And I think that's, I just think that that's so cool, this approach and the way that you're teaching other companies how to do it. Yeah. You know, I'm an avid free market capitalist. Okay. Mm -hmm. Because if you just look at the last 20 or 30 years, oh, several billion people have been brought out of poverty because of capitalism. Mm -hmm. But capitalism without a moral code is greed. Absolutely. Capitalism, mm -hmm. capitalism without God is greed. Capitalism with God is generosity. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I've often asked this question. Maybe socialism with God is good. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I don't know. I'm, I'm a, I tend to be a capitalist, okay? Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. God is everything. Mm. Again, yeah. real quick, and I'll shut my mouth. So I hope people are listening to this because, what, what, again, what you just said was so powerful, right? We live in a time where we want to have these absolute stances about these things. But what you just did was so important because our principles, right? As Christians, we're not trying to figure out which thing is right or wrong, but we're trying to say, where is God in the thing? Right. Yeah, and so the openness you just expressed, like if anybody's listening to that, so much wisdom in that. Don't put so much pressure on yourself to go, OK, where am I standing? But just take the time to ask, where is God in what I'm facing? Right. That's so yeah. powerful. Thank you for that. Mm -hmm. Oh, oh you did. <laughs> Kyle, you want to jump in? Do you have a, a Oh, I was just, um, you know, my what comes to mind for me is um I've been thinking a lot about intentionality and that, that sort of that word keeps coming to mind for me uh, time and time again, uh, because so often we, we live our lives on autopilot. And I think, I think God is calling us to be more intentional with how we live, how we uh, form our, our relationships and our churches and our connections and uh, and that's what I that, that's what I hear in what you're you're talking about. It's like recognizing, you know, let's get back to where what are our principles? You know, what uh, what are our values? What you know, what drives us? What motivates us? Let's take a step back and really be intentional about um, about those things so that those can inform down the line and, and impact what we do. And so I, I was just I just was ruminating on that. Oh, you're muted, Robert. <laughs> that mute. And I promise you, I'm not muting you. And yeah, we're going to get your practice together in a minute. <laughs> I thought he was, uh, I thought you were whispering over to Kai in the next screen. Uh... <laughs> I, I've just got a million things going on in my brain right now, and I'm trying to make sure that I. <laughs> So it's got me scattered because it's so much I want to get out of this conversation uh, because I want to at some point land in the place I want. I'd like for Pete to talk about the flourishing such as prisons and poverty stricken in in, in in our countries. I want that is so. But Pete, let's slow down for a moment for for the folks out there, whether they are entrepreneurs, business people, or whether they're believers who are seeing you bring together these two things. Uh, as John Wesley did, by the way, John Wesley talked about vital passion uh, with with social, uh, with this passion to for to uh, to to address social issues, bringing those together as one piece under Christ. T tell tell folks your faith story. Let's talk about who uh, the story of Pete Oaks and how how you came to be the man you are today. You yeah. know. So I'm a Kansas farm kid. My uh, mom was a teacher. My dad was a farmer. Accepted Christ as Savior at 12. 
I made him Lord at 20. That was a very significant thing. Um, I got out of college and uh, got, I came to Wichita and got in the uh, commercial banking business. At 25, I did, uh, I think, a very significant thing for me, and I didn't realize at the time I wrote my first personal plan. And in that, I, I had a personal mission statement. I listed some values, and I, I wrote down some the BHAGs, big, hairy, audacious goals, right? And one of those goals is I wanted to be an entrepreneur by the time I was 30. So at 29, I talked to my wife. We began to pray through this. I had a couple of mentors that guided me through it. So I started a little... I was in the commercial banking business. I started a little investment banking business at 30. It's interesting, my life, every 10 years at 20, 30, 40, 50, I've had a major thing happen to me. I just turned 70 and I'm waiting for the shoe to drop here. So <laughs> anyway, at 30, uh, started a business. At 40, um, we had acquired a, uh, we felt, uh, we, we were, we were buying and selling companies for everyone else. And I fell in love with our inventory. And I, there was a company that we owned that I wanted to buy and it was a bank. So I bought this bank. It happened to be in severe trouble. Long story short, I was suing people, repossessing assets, whatever. And I was countersued by one of my customers. I went to my attorney and he said, you've lost this thing. The guy before you violated banking laws, you bought the stock in the bank and you own it. Um, Long story short, we started depositions. I was spending $8,000 a day. I was getting nowhere. I woke up on Friday morning, five days into depositions. I was distraught. And I was reading Proverbs 6. And the Oaks translation of that says, if you've gotten yourself in a jam, go humble yourself and beg to get out of the jam. That, at the end of the day, Friday, I went to the man suing me and said, could I, could I meet with you? His attorney gave us permission to do that. I don't know why he did, but he did. I met him at his office at two o'clock on Sunday. I went in, sat down. He came in a little bit and a little gruff. And What do you want? I got up out of my chair. I walked over and I got down on my knees in front of his desk. And I said, Len, uh, I'm a Christian. And um, I was reading in Proverbs 6 on Friday morning that if you've gotten yourself in a jam, go humble yourself and beg to get out of the jam. This lawsuit's got me in a jam. Um, I will go bankrupt. I'm begging you, let me out of this jam. As I looked up, he began to weep uncontrollably. And he said, Pete, um, I became a Christian 30 days ago, and I knew the lawsuit wasn't right, but I didn't know how to get out of it. In 10 minutes, we had the lawsuit settled. Wow. Here is the moral of the story for me. For the first time in my life, I believed, I always thought God's word was kind of for my Christian life. I bifurcated my life. I had my business life and I had my Christian life and I'd bifurcated those two. All of a sudden, this little simple proverb six spoke so much truth and wisdom to me. I said, man, this is amazing. So I started my quiet times were prior to that were very weak. I'll just put it that way. And so I, we'd started this framework about the four principles and the and the flourishing economics. And so I said, every time I read God's word, I'm going to see if there's something in scripture that addresses one of those four values and one of those three forms of capital. I now have several thousand verses that are all categorized according to those. And I've just seen how God has changed my life. So I went from at that point in time, ownership to stewardship, changed my life, changed my business. Unfortunately, I mistook I thought stewardship was financial generosity. So I said, I'm just going to put the hammer down, make a lot of money and give it away. Well, we did that and it was great. And 9-11 rolled around and we just about went broke. And I, I, I looked at God and I said, God, don't you understand what I've done for you? And, <laughs> you know, he, um, he said, in just a week or two, I realized he basically said this to me, not audibly, but it just came across into my heart. Pete, I don't want your money. I want you. I want you. And so at that point, Thomas said, we're going to try this whole doing business thing differently one more time. And so in um, a few years later, um, we wound up uh, uh, needing workers and we wound up in a maximum security prison. Those men have changed my life. They have brought me so close to Christ. It's not even funny. And um, every 10 years, God 
I think I fluctuate between success and surrender. I get successful, then God brings me down to surrender. Success, surrender. And that's probably been the story of my. <laughs> wow. Surrender. surrender. Success, surrender. So it doesn't stop. Some people feel like once you've reached that successful point, no. come back to the surrender point that you failed. But yes. it's just another way to be elevated. Yes. You know, I thought by giving away money, I was doing God's work, but I became proud in being a big giver. I had more pride in giving than I, it was the wrong motive. The difference between arrogance and excellence is motivation. Arrogance is doing the best I can where I am with what I have for the glory of myself. Excellence is doing the best I can where I am with what I have for the glory of God. Glory of God. For the glory yeah. of God. For the glory of God. Wow. Great you story. So, th so then, Kyle, were you about to... No, just that, just that quick aside, right? Like, for, you know, for, for some people that, um, you know, struggle has been not just the way of their life, but struggle has been the mode of generations. Generations, right? Uh, as much as we hear that, you know, money doesn't solve your problems, um, that, you know, you, you can have these really great highs uh, and, and you can have this emptiness. And sometimes we're tempted to think, OK, God, well, when I get X, Y and Z, I will then behave a, a particular, you know, a, a particular way. And and what I'm hearing in the story that he, that he just shared or was really yelling, like screaming in my heart. <clears throat> Is this idea of that, you know, you, no matter what you have or don't have, the principles like the the heart, right? Truly, the gut of who you are, it is what it is, right? Whether you got all the money or not, the who you are is still going to be right there. And at some point, rich or poor, <laughs> you're gonna have to deal with it, right? And so yeah. I just I hope people are hearing these things is that start working on talk. Guys. That's good, bud. That's good. Keep going. Yes, sir. Start, start working on your practices now. Examine your practices now. Look at what you're doing, and that'll tell you the principles that you love, that you worship, right? And then set your life in order. You know, because again, you, you got a witness here in front of you. A lot of times we don't get to talk to people that's successful. And he's just telling you, yeah, I was doing well, but I got caught up in pride. You know, yeah. you it all away. Yeah. But my motivation was wrong. There, I think an, another key point for me was, um, you know, back to economic, social, and spiritual uh, wealth or capital. Okay. I call it capital. I think there's three states of being wealth and what I call flourishing. Okay. Poverty is you, you're lacking one or two or three of those three forms of capital. Okay. Wealth, you have all three of those. You have enough money, you got good friends and you got Jesus. Okay. I think so many of us are wealthy, but the difference between wealth and flourishing, I think is pointed out in the parable of the talents, Matthew 25. If you think back to that, the master was going on a trip he gives one five, one two, and one one. The ones, the servants, the stewards that got five and two, it says they took it and immediately put it to, to work. They took risk with it. So the question for all of us is how much is enough? How much is enough that I need to kind of keep so I'm personally comfortable? But am I willing to take my economic my money, my relationships, and Jesus, and take risk with them and treat it as capital. Capital, by definition, is wealth that you're willing to put at risk and go out and make a difference. When you do that, I think that's when we flourish. I really do. But flourishing won't happen unless we take risk for the kingdom. Wow. 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 You love that. Yeah, go ahead. No, go ahead, Pete. Go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> Don't get me on a roll here. <laughs> no, go, go, um, go, go. You know, and I think this what drives the what drives that is asking the question. The first question we should ask is what what has God given me? Has He given me economic, social, or spiritual wealth? I mean, uh, and which one has of those has He given me an excess? I'm an entrepreneur, so I've been given 
financial excess. You're a pastor, so you've been given excess spiritual wealth. So what have I been given? And then the second question is, am I hoarding it like the one, the guy that took one and buried in his tent? Or am I taking it? And even for me, who, who knows Jesus, am I willing to put my reputation at risk and talk about Jesus? At the beginning of the show, uh, I think Kai was talking about maybe even before we came on, what we should be in church one one week a month and the other three out doing our thing. Are we willing to take the risk and get out of our pew and go ask some people, come to church and hear the good news? Wow. We, you know, we're just, we don't, we don't we take don't enough risk. risk in life. Wow. And the difference between no risk and risk is the difference between wealth and, wow. and flourishing. Wow. And Luke 12 is the guy who, the, the rich young ruler, you know, I've got, you know, uh, he's a wealthy guy. All right. What he did with his wealth, he said, boy, I've had a great crop. I'm going to tear down my barns. I'm going to big more. I'm going to build more. And he says to God, I'm going to just sit back, eat, drink, and be merry. And God says, you fool. Tonight, your life will be taken. So, gosh, I just, the older I get, the more I want to taste risks for the kingdom. Mm. You and know, and, can, and if, <laughs> You know, I like that. Um, and the the reason I think we can take risk and, and risk looks a lot of different ways. And Absolutely. sometimes it is just sort of stepping out and having a conversation that God is prompting on our hearts to have with someone. Um, but the, the reason we can take risk is because uh, we foster Christian community and we do it alongside of others who, at least theoretically, um you know we're we're joined to and so we're not out on our own taking risk um we have the encouragement and support of a body of believers that um that are you know that we we do this alongside of and do we do this together with i love that kyle because so as we're talking about taking risk what i hear you saying kyle is that as believers as followers of Jesus, that we have even we should have even more courage to take risk because we know we don't have to take risk alone. We shouldn't be have to be taking. We're not. Risk. Our, yeah, we're not alone. If we, we are, I mean, if we do our Christian walk on our own, then yeah, it's really scary to you know to risk, risk. what I have uh, without any fallback. Uh, but as you know, if we think of ourselves in community, we think of the early church uh, and the risks they took and the ways they stepped out in faith but they were doing it as a community of believers, not as individuals. Yeah. And, they, and they flourished. And they flourished. Because they were a little small subculture in, a, in, a, in, the, large, in the greatest, at that time, the greatest power that it, the world had ever known. They were a little small subculture. And in uh, a couple of hundred years, they had consumed the empire because they kept taking risks. They kept taking risks. They kept taking whatever God gave them and reinvesting it, risking it for the sake of, of to the glory of God, to the glory of God and mm -hmm. for the sake of others. And they kept flourishing. They kept and, um, and it's not prosperity gospel because um, they didn't prosper like <laughs> personally, individually, in many right. respects, they gave up their lives. But even that risk, Right. They gain the kingdom. They gain the kingdom. Even when they give up their lives and risk everything, they gain the kingdom. So, you know, it just puts risk in a whole different, Christianity puts risk in a whole different light. Uh, and it, it really sets us free to um, to be emboldened than anything else. I, so, yeah. so Pete and Kai, Kai, that's what a problem. So what would you, so what would, how do you talk to church leaders and Pete, I'd like to hear from you. And then Kyle, what you're saying about us being the body of Christ, and that should give that should give us courage. What do you say to church leaders who are afraid of taking risks? How do you guide them forward? What wisdom? So um, here's the way I look at leadership. Um, connected leaders bring vision, humility, and courage to a team effort. 
So if you're leading any organization, it's the vision, the vision to what should the vision to see what should be done. Okay, it, it takes a special person to have that vision, I think, in some sense. The vision to see what should be done. The humility to believe it can only be done with the help of God and others and a lot of others. And then last is just the courage to persevere until it is done. Oftentimes we we think we think we're we've got a big vision and we're humble and we get going, and then we run into a, a brick wall. And that's where courage has to come into play. And um, if it's really been a God vision uh, and you really have the humility to do that, you should be able to push through with courage and get to where you need to get. Wow. Great stuff. So say a word to families, husbands, wives, single mothers, single parents who are at a place right now, Pete, where they are struggling uh, in life financial struggle, relational struggle, and they're trying to figure out, and they're hearing us talking about flourishing, and they're like, man, how in the heck do I get from, like, I'm trying to figure out how I'm gonna pay my bills next month, and I'm trying to figure out how I'm gonna keep my marriage together. Like, how do I, where do I even begin to move towards flourishing? Yeah, oh boy. Um. Life is hard. Let's just face the facts. Life is hard. Okay. All of us in the middle of flourishing have hard times. Okay. I think there are two responses to hard. Um, one is, and it go, this goes back to the purpose of life. Okay. When you face hard, you need to look at the purpose of life. And I think there's really only two options for the purpose of life. I'm living for myself or my, I'm living for something greater than myself. Okay. So when hard hits, what we want to do, I think, is we think back, we, be, we, we, we become inwardly focused. We're on the throne. And if I go back to those four values, well, I'll go to those in just a minute. When we're focused on ourselves, we, we focus on what I call the three I'm sorry about this. Three no. more P. <laughs> we talk. We talk about pride, pleasure, and possessions. Uh, Eve faced those three questions when she looked at the apple. Uh, Solomon faced those. Jesus faced those coming out of the wilderness. And uh, John in First John two fifteen sixteen. Do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the Father, the love of the world's not in him. For everything in the world. The cravings of sinful man, possessions, the lust of his eyes, pleasure, and the boasting of what he has and does, pride, comes not from the Father, but from the world. So when we have hard times, if we revert back to ourselves, we're worried about pride, pleasure, and possessions. Wow. Okay. Wow. If, if when hard times hit, we say, my purpose is to honor God, okay, then so... If everything in the world, if every sin is falls within pride, pleasure, and possession, what are the three antidotes to take care of pride, pleasure, and possessions? I think pride is to serve. I think um, pleasure is really arrogance, is to be excellent. And I think possessions has to do with stewardship. If you remember back to my four principles, yeah. serve people, be excellent, be a good steward. And guess what? That that fourth principle, honor God, that's, if you look at a triangle, that's the, tri the with the four triangles in it, honor God is in the middle, and then we serve, we're excellent, and we're good stewards. Even when hard times hit, if we do that, I think God will bless that. It takes so much faith. So we have the world calling us to success, pride, pleasure, and possessions, Jesus calling us to surrender, serving, excellence, and stewardship. The problem with me is there's one in the middle called significance, success, significance, surrender. I like sur significance because I can live with one foot in the world and one foot in the kingdom. I get all the benefits of the world and I get all the benefits of the kingdom. The problem is Jesus says, or God says in Re uh, Revelation 3.15, I wish you either were cold or hot, not lukewarm, 
because I will spit you out of my mouth. When, when hard times hit, more faith, more faith in serving, more faith in being excellent, more faith in being a good steward. And I think that's what takes us out. It's difficult, but when, whenever we really hit the wall, when I revert back to being living a surrendered life, this is success, holding on tightly to the things Pete accomplished. This is significance, holding on loosely so that God can use them. This is surrender, all in. Everything's on the table. Everything's on the table. I'm, I like significance, but God wants us surrendered. Yeah. <laughs> great, great stuff. Great stuff. Does anybody want? Yeah, you know, just again, that uh, I'm just playing back that idea, right? That the, the, the number of times, you know, that the word encourages us to serve other people. Uh, even when we look at, <laughs> I'm, I'm amazed when I look at the life of Jesus towards the end, when he knows, knows he's going up on the, like knows he's focused on he was serving. He was serving every, <laughs> everybody else, everybody else. Right. And so, um, that is such a, I mean, again, just echoing this because it's its such a true point. Uh, and this is one of those moments when I have to chuckle at myself as a Christian uh, because, you know, all the times that we go, oh, you know, we close our eyes like this. And we get really sincere. And we go, oh, God, give me the deep things, you know, <laughs> want the <want> revelation. <laughs> and, God is, and God is really like, yeah, just hush and let it go. Surrender. There Surrender. it is. Surrender. You know, and and I love that you pointed out th th this other idea is understanding when we're talking about hum human flourishing, right? That it's it there there there's still pain still. in that. There's still heartache uh, within that. But again, for us, it's just like you said, we in our faith, we have been called to the big collective practice that when we're attacked at our innermost we should we should turn to our community the hardest <laughs> you know to to serve and to be lifted up and to be loved so i mean it's just a uh again i'm i am i'm taken back over here at what we're talking about and again i just want people that are thinking that money is going to solve all their problems i i hope these principles are sinking in because who, again, who you are, you're good. You're going to have some of these same experiences, but it's about it's it's about looking at your principles, checking your practice, see how you're performing. Just like just like it's been laid out before us. That's a listen. We get three point sermons all the time. <laughs> That's a four point framework. Okay, <laughs> work it, work it. So, so what you know, one of the things that I keep hearing is how principled. Uh, Pete is, has been. So at the age of, I believe you said 20, 26, you, were, you wrote your first life plan. Yeah. Statement and how you, you've, over time, as you, as you live, as you, as you have lived your life and learned things from God and learned things from life that you've, these principles that you've noticed and that you've incorporated and structured and as frameworks for living. And it's just, I, I just like that because, you know, I, what when I see people living in living in chaos, Pete, what that means to me is that they have no principles they're living by. They're living from emotion to emotion. They're living yes. from drama to drama. They're yes. living from day to day. But there's no there are no principles that they're living by. Yes. And if, so if you don't have principles, all you have is chaos. And then yes. when adversity hits, man, that's like. Cause what do you do then? Cause you don't know, you don't know what to do. And I think about now, of course, Saint, all the St. Mark folks are going to go, okay, here we go. But, but the story of the karate kid, the, the movie karate kid, how Mr. Miyagi, like he wants to learn karate, right? He wants to learn whatever the form of, and, but he wants to go on a, in a place and do all the, and Mr. Miyagi has him washing the car, has him doing these basic principal things that he yeah. thinks makes absolutely no sense. And then so one day, Mr. Miyagi is aggravated and he starts, saying, okay, you want to fight? So he starts doing, and he says, do the thing, do the car wash. And all of a sudden, Daniel realizes that all of those little 
principled actions are actually principles that will help him. And then, of course, every movie keeps doing it. They're, they're, they're one of the movies when he's like getting beaten really bad. It's the end of the movie and he's about to quit. And Mr. Miyagi tells him to focus and he stands up and he starts doing this print, this base, the, the print, the basics. He's like doing this basic thing that he would do every day. And the guy's looking at him like, what the heck are you doing? But he goes back to the basics. He goes back to the principles. And yes. through that, it, it restores his confidence and he's able to win. And I just think that that is so true. And I appreciate you so much saying that these principles you've lived by. And because I want to, I just think that people, for those people that are struggling, that are facing hard time, and they just can't make, is is you gotta have some principles. You you live by. What do you believe in? What do you what what are, what are things that really matter to you? And uh, and as a, as if you're a follower of Jesus, He's given us those principles. Humility, and we can talk about humility in different ways. Pastor Kyle Pete talks about humility. One form of that is how we use power. Is giving up power, using power for the sake of others. Yes. That form. Uh, the humility that 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 takes us out of pride and arrogance, but humility and surrender and service are principles that if you if we live by those principles, we can flourish in all seasons. I just absolutely believe that, Pete. Yeah. We have a, what we call a four way test. I use this personally. I use it in business. You could use it. Here'd be my advice to your church leadership. We ask four questions every time we make a decision. If you're unsure of making the decision, here are four questions we ask. Does it honor God? Does it serve people? Can we do it with excellence? And are we being good stewards? Wow. And it just, it makes decision making so easy for us. Hmm. Um, yeah, have you know, have you noticed that in lead, in your leadership meetings that there are cert, there are certain ones of those questions certain questions get attached to certain people like there are certain people that are going to be the yeah, absolutely that, they got, that's going to be their focus and then you have the people that are going to be but is that are we being good stewards and certain yes. kind of get connected to certain questions right yeah yeah the um, you know the honor God quote does it honor God is the is it principled the, the, does it serve people? That is the uh, relational piece of it. Can we can we do it with excellence? That is the operational piece. And are we good stewards? That's a return on investment. And we literally look at economic, social, and spiritual returns on investment. If we do this, what's our potential spiritual return by doing that? Wow. We used to we um, you know back in the '90s when I thought giving away money was going to get me to heaven or get me a better place in heaven. Let me put it that way. Um, I, I didn't want to give people raises because I wanted to make more money to give it away. Now, how Christian. Mm. Wow. wow. No, don't give them a raise because we got to give more to Jesus. Wow. Now we're the opposite. What we used to take and give away externally, a chunk of that is given away internally. Wow. And, um, we have a month ago, we had one of our inmates at workforce in the prison. His mom's house burned down in two days. His 120 workers who worked with him on their own raised $5,000. We didn't ask them. We didn't tell them. They came up with that on their own to help his mom out. Wow. You know, and it's just when you get those principles inculcated in your life, it, people just start the culture becomes very flourishing. <laughs> mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Well, I mean, look, we've, I, I heard you mention that, you know, you have some folks that you work with, um, some who are incarcerated, uh, and you use the term flourishing ag again. So I'm going to see if I can kind of tie these things together. And I'll, could you tell us a little bit, um, you know, how you got started and what drives your passion to work with those who are incarcerated? Yes. So in 2006, we had a rapidly growing manufacturing company in Hutchinson, Kansas, and we couldn't find enough entry-level work workers to come and 
we could hire one or two here, but we needed 10, 20. So I found out about the work release program where they take inmates in the Hutchinson Correctional Facility. It's a state prison in Hutch with about 2,000 men in it. They would bus over eight or 10 men. We'd work them during the day and they'd bus them back to prison at night. After 30 days of that, I went to the warden. I said, boy, this is great. I need 20 more guys. He goes, I don't have them, but I, we are vacating space in the prison. And if you could figure out how to move your business inside the walls, I've got 1,200 men and 20,000 square feet available. So within 30 days, we'd moved our business literally inside the walls of a maximum security prison. Now, I have to admit, uh, I think I did it out of greed because we needed workers. But I've got to tell you, within 90 days, I'm looking at these men and I'm saying, the only difference between them and me is they got caught. I'm, I'm being a bit facetious, but you know what I mean. And so I said, well, what are we going to do? It, uh, prison is a desert of human flourishing. No money. You make 50 cents a day if you work for the state. You're in gangs. You're getting beat up. If you stand for anything, you're ostracized. And there is good, fairly good spirituality in prison because that's the only thing they have left to go to. OK, so that is really when this whole idea of economic, social and spiritual capital came to play. And I said, that is flourishing. So we believe I like the parable of the Good Samaritan because um, you had the guy left by the road, beat up, dying. And no offense, Pastor Johnson, but the religious guys walked by and says they walked around him. <laughs> They walked away. They didn't want anything to do with the guy. But the Good Samaritan, I think he was a business guy, <laughs> picked him up and took him to the hotel. You see what happens is, and those three forms of economic, social, spiritual capital don't lead with spiritual capital. The priest and the Levite, I think, looked over and said, if that guy just get Jesus, everything would be fine. No, it doesn't work like that. So you lead with economic capital. Give them a good job. Just give something to them if they need that. But give them a hand up. The second thing is become their friend. Let them know that you love them like you love yourself. And guess what happens? The doors to spiritual capital fly open when people know that you care. And so I just, um, when we did that, it just changed the way I did business. So we had... We just started putting all these programs in place. We have, uh, by the way, we pay our guys, I think our average wage in prison right now is close to $15 an hour. Okay. Mm. Uh, if you work for the state of Kansas, you make 50 cents a day, maybe a dollar a day. Okay. Mm. So we, we give them a good job. We don't even set the wage. The state of Kansas does. Um, so we give them a good job. Then socially and spiritually, we have 15,000 hours of online training. It can be Bible studies. It can be fathering classes. It can be how to be a black belt in lean manufacturing, how to be an entrepreneur. But we're socially trying to raise their level up of consciousness, social consciousness. And the last thing is, you know, we, um, we, we let Jesus open the door, but we, we walk in very rapidly. We started a seminary in the prison. We had eight men graduate. Those eight men are changing the prison. We've got 23 in the second class. We've just finished building a million dollar church inside the prison. Wow. And so, and these guys, uh, my land, it used to be when we'd have a newbie come in. Um, now the culture is so inculcated in flourishing that the moment a newbie, uh, somebody that's in prison that's now starts to work for us, within 30 days, they are talking. When I come up, they're talking. We are family. We do it this way. Look up there on the wall. We honor God. We serve people. We're excellent. We're good stewards. They'll just rip this stuff off to us. And mm -hmm. so it's just all about culture. And it's it's been the best thing Jesus has ever let me do. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So some people talk about it. <laughs> but then there are others that are going into 
the bowels, the worst places of our world where we have rejected people because they've gotten caught and maybe they've been the worst in the worst place of their lives. And you, this is where the research came in because, and I'm glad that you said that initially I began out of greed because of course, that's the first thing I thought when I heard about Pete Oaks was, okay, he has um, a manufacturing plant in the prison. He's getting free labor basically. But then when I began to hear the stories of you providing employment for men to pay for their daughters. I'm, I'm, I'm lost you for a minute, but I'm back. When you are, you are providing employment for men to still be part of their families, provision, providing for their college educations by their own hard earned money while they're paying their debt to society. I was just blown away. You know, usually when dad goes to jail, dad is no longer a viable mm -hmm. resource for me. There's nothing that he can pour into me. But when dad can be being responsible for the decisions that he made in his life, but still able to pour into me, not only are you helping dad, but you're giving me confidence and you're allowing my own social structure to still allow to pour into me too. If we take this model and put it into our own policies and procedures in our governments, in our churches, in our workplaces, that's when we begin to win. And I, I wish four friends, each of us, four friends, just sharing these basic principles and not talking about it. We all say that we're Christians, but then when we, when the rubber hits the road, our motivation is actually, it, it's shown on our faces and we become upset. I'm guilty of it. You know, someone stepped on my toe. What I really like about you, Pete, is you said, I have a thousand scriptures. Did y'all pick up on that? <laughs> I have a thousand scriptures that over my lifetime, and that's the key. I said it, I, I've said it to my own children. I wish that someone had laid out the word for me and made it practical. And that's what you've done. You've made it a reliable resource for every day and every experience in your life. And I know you live it because when you speak it, it just comes out of you chapter and verse. So if we stop putting this Bible in front of people and quoting it and start showing people how to live it, that's when the church becomes relative again. Yes. Amen. He said, well, I love what, 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 what you said, Pete, about when we, when we love people and we connect to them. Yeah. And, and because what, what many churches do is that we want to give people something, but we don't really want to be a part of their life. Yes. But, Let's go over here and give these poor people something, and then we disappear, and then we we feel good. Re really, the people don't even we feel good about what we did, but connecting is when we serve people, then connect with them, and then engage in in activities that can help them transform. That Do that's life with them. Well, and here's the thing: all of that, he, Pete, you you said those things are just doing what God calls us to do. And you said, that's when the spiritual gates fly open and then you can make the deposit about Jesus in them, right? So, so Kai, what we usually do is we start with Jesus. <laughs> right. They don't want to hear it. They don't want to hear it. <laughs> and, people, and people know we don't care about them right. and they know we don't want anything to do with them. We, wanna, we don't want to be connected to them in any way. We just want to, you know, we led somebody to Jesus. <clears throat> That on the on the the information Yolanda we got to send into the conference we had five trans mm -hmm. tribe five new converts <laughs> and five, three baptisms well, three baptisms but <laughs> there is really no community no connection and then we wonder why people don't really open their lives up to us and yes. we just have to do life with them we gotta do we life. have to do life with them. And but, make an investment like the Good Samaritan did. He made investments for that person's future. Mm -hmm. So making these investments, empowering these men so that they they're way, making a good salary. They're doing community. They're being and they're mm -hmm. being, being given opportunities to explore life skill training so that they can be prepared not only to be good carpenters or whatever, but to be good fathers and to be mm -hmm. and then 
if you really feel a calling to this, there's even a seminary here where you can begin to explore. Whoa. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. You like, threw that one in. That came out of nowhere. Doing community with doing community with folks and, and engaging in real transformation. And that's when the the gates come open. Yes. You know, well, Robert, but you all are telling me you want me to go around people because you know these spirits jump off of people. <laughs> and, <laughs> but I again just don't go on don't, that. Don't 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 because <laughs> I'll jump on a soapbox but, and start talking but, about people. But, who are so holy they can't do life with broken people because they the spirits might jump off on them. And and listen, so this is a, a, I I just like reiterating this stuff because I'm like, man, there's things that people say we let it go. You know, sometimes when when we take risk um, in our life and and we do things, we may start out in a place that is not the best place. Yeah. <laughs> Number one. Being able to look at your performance, examine your practice, and go, my principles were jacked up. I gotta, I gotta flip this around. That is so much maturity, so much growth. But then also, people, as Christians, that's one of the benefits of us being Christian. <laughs> God is not, <clears throat> God is not writing down all of your wrong and hurling thunderbolt after thunderbolt at you for being wrong is that when oh man when you come when you understand and you admit and go oh man god that that part wasn't right his answer is yes and amen he's he's he goes okay you're right let's move forward right and yeah. then uh and what pete has laid out for us my gosh robert i say it again practice one you know preach one sunday Practice the rest. Practice that when when you go serve food at the soup kitchen, <clears throat> it's hard to keep the preconceived notions you have about homeless people yeah. or the unhoused. Yeah. You know what? When you when you leave your church and you go and you, you just go visit some churches that don't look like yours, it's hard to carry around hate wow. of another culture wow. or another race. <laughs> I'm going to make a lot of people mad. Please, sir. Please, sir. <laughs> Some of these people that you otherize, be it because of their sexual practices or how they identify, I guarantee you, if you would just spend some time around them and give yourself the opportunity to do a little bit of life with them, you're either going to see a lot of bit of yourself of them in them, or watch this, you're going to see a lot of somebody else that you love in them. Wow. And it is it is. And at that point, it's hard to turn your back on our true mission. Jesus was all about the work of reconciliation <laughs> from the stars to the sands. And if you want to have a true feeling of fulfillment, this is why I do philanthropy and all this other stuff. One of the best feelings in, in my world is to be around somebody and to see that they look at you with that look or they have that moment where they know that they belong and that they're seen and that they are loved, not because of what they do, but just because they're there. And uh, particularly my last one, and I put my soapbox away uh, as an African-American male. I think about the number of people that look like me that are in these prisons. Yeah. I think about my own upbringing, how important it is to me to provide for my family. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and, and, and it's it's almost uh, hard to say. But, but, but being able to find moments like this and know that there's parts of our systems and things that we do that are broken to see small glimpses of what community should look like, mm -hmm. uh, to, to see small glimpses of how we as Christians have the ability to, to adopt people in a sense, to graft them into this holy family. is such a beautiful uh, testimony of who we are and what we do. This gift that God has given us, this life that Christ has commissioned us to, is that, and you'll ne we'll never know really how these men's lives have been changed. That's right. We'll never know 
how many children we've saved without without going to the ballot box to yell at one another about abortion. We'll we'll never know how many families we pulled out of poverty, how many young men we stopped from getting shot because extra money was in the house. We will never know the real impact of these things. And I believe that when Jesus said, in even greater things you will do in my name, see, I think these are the things that he was talking about. Amen. It wasn't all the people you were going to touch and they shout and they fall out, you know, and their legs grow and arms grow, but it was the <laughs> generations that you would change because you would show excellence, because you would be humble, because you would be a good steward, right? Because you would just stick to the basic principles of who God has called us to be. So, soapbox away. I'm done for the day. Wow. You, you Tears and all. <laughs> You have uh, y'all got me in tears right now. So one final thing, and I want to say this, and I just want to again thank Pete for coming on. Um, and he says something that I, so one of the things that I take away is that we all have some kind of capital, <coughs> uh, spiritual capital, some kind of gift that we something that we're we're strong in or that we have an abundance of. And the call for me is to take whatever abundance I have and put it to risk to the glory of God, not to try to tell somebody else what to do with the capital they have. See, that that's a huge, and I've spent too much of my life trying to do that, Yolanda, trying to tell other people what they should be doing with that. <laughs> <laughs> instead of instead of risking with the capital that I that God has given me. He said all in. All in, all, all in. in. I love the hand, just all in with all the in. I have, with the capital that I have, and that's what Pete has done. No, no, we we haven't heard any criticism of, criticism about what other people are doing. It's this journey of what is God given me, and how can I give? How can I use it to the glory of God so that not that that not just my flourish, but that others flourish. Mm -hmm. There's flourishing. There's flourishing for the incarcerated people. There's flourishing. I wish we had time to talk about poverty stricken countries because I know that th with that, that, that you've seen that, ha how that is happening. You want to say just real quickly something about that, Pete? Um, you know, we've got businesses in Mexico and Honduras, and we employ about, I think, 1,100 in Mexico uh, in the most cartel ridden. Mm -hmm. uh, toughest city in Mexico, Zacatecas. And last quarter, we have eight chaplains. So we, we lead with economic capital. We make great friends. And the result of that, out of 1,100 folks, we had 360 confidential conversations last quarter and 60 gospel presentations. And it's just because when we care about people, then they come and they start sharing. And it's and it's easy to say, well, you know, have you have you thought about Jesus and what he can do? Or, you know, we just and it's just um, the the power of taking some risk, you know, but it's uh, those people. Uh, gosh, I. I love those people in poor countries. They work hard. They, uh, oh, I just, it's just terrific. I, I love those inmates. I'm telling you, I, uh, you know, they out give our, we have a, a matching program, a, a generosity program. Our inmates out give on a per capita basis about four to one, a regular, wow. a regular folks. Because they are so thankful that they that they make fifteen measly bucks an hour. It's amazing. Yeah. Oh, yes. Mm. <laughs> I have to get one of those in every at least one of those. Every, Yolanda has to get a couple of amazings in, and I have to get a yes in. So there you go. So we got we got it in. Um, I got a question. I've got a question for you. Okay. When you come to prison with me, I'm ready. Okay, we'll, we'll set it up. We'll set it up. Let's. I, I'd love to you do it. I'd love to do get, it. To come get, to. get ready to get blessed. 
Absolutely. Amen. 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 Yeah. We were supposed to, yeah, we, as a matter of fact, we, I'm glad you brought that up because we haven't followed up on that. You had invited me to come over and see what's well, going on. Yeah. Well, we'll, we'll so and COVID, COVID has really shut the prison down and it's just now starting to open back up. So mm. okay. uh, over the next quarter, I think we could we could get in there. Okay. Absolutely. Yeah. This has been outstanding. <laughs> this has been outstanding. Outstanding. I mean, I don't believe that there is a um, portion of life that hasn't been breathed into this evening. And I mean, and when you walk away, here's the here, here's your takeaway. You can ask these questions in anything. Does it honor God? Does it serve? Does it serve people? Can we do it with excellence? And are we good stewards? In every aspect of your every life. Aspect. Every aspect. Every aspect. Yolanda, we're we're applying that immediately to uh St. Mark. We're taking that into our from this point on, we're taking that I, in. We're I kind of thought we would probably see that. Right? <laughs> your Absolutely. sermon probably has changed a little bit between yeah. what you've been working on. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I think I just I think that's a great framework. Great framework. Any final comments, pa Pastor Kyle? You have any final comments? Um, you know, I was I was thinking um, about that idea of risk some more, and you know, as as an entrepreneur, that's kind of you know, you do risk assessment, and you you have your capital, and you're like, I'm I'm putting my mouth where my money is, money money where the, my mouth is, and I'm gonna I'm gonna try things. Um, I don't know if you can be an entrepreneur unless you're willing to put some stuff at stake. And I think about um, churches that I've been a part of that have been so risk averse. And part of it is because we're, we're so afraid of failure and we don't want to be the person that people are talking about, you know, five years later, like, well, Remember when Kyle had that brilliant idea of uh, doing that thing, and and so it keeps us from trying new things and being creative and listening to the spirit, and it's a lot easier to just do the same things as a church, because nobody's going to get criticized for continuing the program that we've been doing forever. And, and so my encouragement to our churches and our people is like, make mistakes boldly, like, don't be afraid to try new things. And, um, you know, it, it reminds me of what, what happens, you know, I, I was told this, uh, in, in regards to church before where, um, you know, a family immigrates to the United States and they've got, you know, everything they have, they pour into a business that they start and they, they just pour everything into it and it's successful. And then they pass it on to their kids and their kids are so afraid of losing the business that they don't take any risks whatsoever, even though that's what oh the business God. was built on. Man. And unfortunately, I think that's what we do as churches is like the, our predecessors risked Risk. so much to Risk. start the churches and to start the programs that we have. And now as churches, we're like so afraid to lose anything. And so um, I just think a lot, a lot of, uh, you know, that idea of risk and it's, it's not easy, but it is, it is important. Godly confidence. Pastor Kyle mm -hmm. at Dottie Thompson nailed it. You are listening to the spirit, sir. You are speaking directly into the life of churches, including St. Yeah. Mark. Yeah. But the previous generation took risks. Mm -hmm. And then the next generation inherited and became yep. got to protect it and keep it. And yes. then watch it. And then as they do that, you watch it decline yeah. and diminish. Wow. Churches close every day with money in the bank. With money in the bank. <laughs> with money in the bank. Yeah. This is a, an example I use on a, a kind of a practical application of taking risk. It's um, en envision yourself sitting in a room in a chair and there's three or four doors in front of you and you you want to go do something different. OK, I think that you need to sit in that chair and you need to pray and you need to prepare and you need to plan. And then when you think God is ready to where you're going, you need to get up and walk over, 
and jiggle a door handle on the on one of those doors that you think you could go in. And if it opens, walk in. If it doesn't, go back, sit in the chair, pray, plan, and prepare some more. Waiting time is not wasted time. God, the the bigger the bigger the the bigger the stuff behind the door, the more time it's going to take to get there. Yeah. So yeah. pray and please. Pray. It, this isn't some Las Vegas roll of the dice kind <laughs> of. Thing. This is a prayed up, pl prepared up, planned up deal, and I, I think God doesn't care what we do, but He cares how and why we do it. So He oftentimes gives us a desire of our heart to go do what we want to do. Hmm. But do it for him and in a manner that just glorifies him to no end. Yeah. Yes, Miss Jan. I love that. Go jiggle on the door if it doesn't go open, go back. Uh Pete, now I, I don't know if you've been around. I'm afraid of opening the wrong door, right, Pastor? Right, Kyle. Here, here, yes. here is what I've done. I've gone up and I've jiggled the door and it doesn't open. So what I do is I step back about three feet, I lift one foot up. And I lunge forward and I kick the door in. Wow. Then when you're in that room, you go, what in the world am I doing in here? This is crazy. I should have waited on God. I've pushed ahead of God. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Good stuff. Oh, good stuff. Good stuff. <laughs> good stuff. I mean, um, wait, Robert's. Wait. Robert's oh, sermon for Sunday is jiggle the handle. Right. It's, I'm telling you, his whole sermon has been blown away. He's like back at the drawing board. <laughs> jiggle. Oh, okay. oh, hey, I've, got, I've got about 20 sermons out of tonight. I know, right? About 20 sermons. And I'm so inspired and so ready to, to you know, this is like fuel and, and uh, energy to keep leading and keep loving and keep serving people and uh, and operating by godly principles, even when you they don't seem to be working. Maybe they're not working for you personally in a selfish way, but that they're yes. working for God's people. Yeah. Yes. Can I point out to both of you, we talked about him coming on before. It wasn't time. Yeah. This was the absolute the right time yeah, for him to come time. on ignite. Absolute right time in God's timing. Absolutely, guys. It's eight thirty. We could. We could. So Ooh, we got to. Bill is high. I, I, <laughs> I know. We went way over. Yeah. You all. <laughs> inside joke, folks. Inside joke. Inside joke. A conversation before we went live. But thank you all for tuning in again. I want to remind all of you. Well, let's let's let's. Let's pray. Let's uh, have a moment of prayer with Pete and then we'll let him go. And then uh, we'll see if we have any final announcements that we'd like to share, uh, not only from St. Mark, but from Covenant Evangelical Church and Pastor Kyle, and also some things that uh, Kai, Kai Green speaks and other outlets where he's available and doing connecting with people and serving people. We'll make those announcements. Pete, will you, would you? Pray for, pray for, pray us out. Would you mind? You Father God, we are humbled by the sheer fact that you've allowed us to steward all this stuff that's so, that's so neat. Lord, I just thank you for the opportunity to do that. Lord, I am so grateful for St. Mark and for the leadership team here. I would pray that, um, I would pray that you'd give them a sense of what is the right risk to take as they plan and they go forward. Uh, Lord, make that give them just wisdom beyond their human nature, that they can uh, take the appropriate risk, and particularly with the spiritual capital we've all been given. Uh, Lord, we thank you for how you've blessed us economically, socially, and spiritually, and I would just pray that we wouldn't take that lightly. We thank you for that. And Lord, I think of all the folks in the world who aren't flourishing, uh, wherever that may be. And Lord, give a break our heart for those folks and show us how we can help them flourish in a much uh, greater way. And so, Lord, uh, just thank you for our time this evening. Thank you for some new great friends. And we just pray this in the great and gracious name of Jesus. Amen. 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 Wow. Oh, you are amazing. Yes. 
Yes. No, I'm just a, what a blessing. A farm kid who's trying to follow Jesus. Well, you are a blessing. I won't use Yolanda's word amazing. Uh, <laughs> that, that's just Yolanda. But you are indeed a blessing to the body of Christ. You've been a blessing to us tonight. We pray for God, uh, just his hand to continue to be on your life and guide you. Thank you so much for coming on, folks. Thank you for tuning in. And uh, I've seen some people say that you want to go to the prison with me when I visit with Pete. So if you want to do that, follow up with me. And when we set a date, you're welcome to come along with me so we can go see what the wonderful thing God's doing over there uh, with those men in over in Hutch. Thanks be to God. Pete, thank you so much. Have a good night in your London. I will follow up with you uh, on tomorrow. And thank you so yeah. much. Okay. Perfect. All it's right. been a pleasure. Thank All you. Right. All right. Uh, folks, thank you all for tuning in. Just a couple of announcements. I want to remind all the seniors that we began, we were re returning with our Singers Fellowship on, on Thursdays at 12 noon. And uh, tomorrow is by Zoom. If you go to the St. Mark Facebook page tomorrow, it'll be the Zoom link will be posted there. I also sent it to you in email. If you didn't get the email, that means we don't have your email address. So you need to make sure you get your email address to the church so that when we send out these emails about important stuff, you will get the you will get the information, and you'll be able to connect. And then on tomorrow evening, if you've got an idea in mind about a life group, movie club, prayer club, uh, a sister girl club, a brother name club. <laughs> I was second to see if Kai was still listening. He just wasn't going to respond. He heard you. He said, I'm not tuned into that. So, folks, here's a question. What are you passionate about? What do you enjoy doing that's healthy and that brings you joy? And we're just asking you to invite other people into that and build community and do life together. We're not asking you to be super Christian, super prayer warrior, super Bible study leader. We're just asking you to invite people into the things that you do that bring you joy, that make you come alive, invite other people into it and uh, and just see what God does with those friendships. That's it. That's do it. Do life with one another. Do life with one another. And it doesn't have to be 12 people to two, 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 three people, you know, I'm, I'll I'll go back to Jesus where two or three are gathered in my name. I'll be in the midst. You don't have to do nothing holy. You ain't got to do something to impress people with your spiritual knowledge. Where, where two or three are gathered, I'll be there. So uh, if you're interested in, in, in learning more about life groups, uh, let me if you don't have the Zoom link already, let me know. Uh, you all know everybody has my cell number and email address. Reach out to me and let me know, and I'll send you the link so you can tune into the uh, training on tomorrow. It'll be about 45 minutes to an hour, and it'll be succinct and clear, and then you can start your life group. You can get started whenever you're ready. Some of you are ready to start immediately. Others will say, you know what, let me think about it, pray about it, and maybe the first of the year, and that's absolutely fine. We're just find, trying to find new ways to engage God's people instead of sitting around, Pastor Kyle, waiting for people to come back to a dat gum building. Uh, Jesus didn't say go make disciples if they if when they come to the building, go make disciples. So we're you just only trying do it between ten and eleven. <laughs> you can yeah, you can only make disciples at fifteen twenty five North Rain, and it's got to be between ten and eleven thirty. Give them an extra thirty between yeah. ten and eleven thirty. If you don't make disciples, then they, then the work can't then the kingdom can't grow, right? So that's the other thing. And then on Sunday, invite a friend and then wear your favorite gear. Except no cowboy jerseys in the place. <laughs> we have uh, we have informed all of our Gideon tribe, our our. Uh, gate watchers that if anybody tries to come in with the cowboy jersey or anything related to the cowboys you would not be allowed in the building we'll that's, you know what that's fine if you don't want no human flourishing going <laughs> on <laughs> I'm, try I'm trying to help you Jack Lord help okay so now it's character now if he's character competence and cowboy fan right <laughs> anyway uh, so thank you all. Pastor Kyle, what's going on going on over at the Covenant Church? And St. Mark, tune in to what he's saying so that it might be something that we can participate in with, with ECC. Yeah, I mean, we've got uh, Sunday school in full swing now and, and kind of getting back into this swing of um, regular rhythms and our 
you know, small groups and things um, starting up. Some of the some of them kind of went on hiatus over the summer. So um, right now we're still kind of uh, getting into fall stuff. So not too much to to report, but just an encouragement for everybody to be praying for our churches, for St. Mark and for Journey and um, the churches in our community to to see flourishing as well and and uh, really a movement of the spirit. Amen. 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 And look forward to hopefully we can do something this fall um, yeah. for the end of the year. Our churches can do something. We did something uh, for Holy Week last 2022. So maybe we can find a way to do something together this this fall winter call mm. for the end of the year. So we look forward to that. Kai, what's going on over at Kai Green Speaks and what else are you engaged in and can invite people to? Yeah, uh, as always, you know, check out the page or really go take a look at my Facebook page. I was having a conversation with someone around uh, the value of the human body uh, in regards to some of the things that's been going on in our society. Uh, we had a good little article about that. So if you're curious, you want to dive in a little bit deeper on what it means uh, to appreciate the human body, uh, check out our latest blog on Boom Goes the Bodies. Wow. Awesome. That sounds awesome. And I will tell you guys that Kai and I are talking to Dr. Shana Masheko. We're in a conversation with her uh, about doing a, a special Ignite session where we to come on and talk about the movie The Woman King. Uh, there's been some negative, some ugly backlash against that movie that is uninformed. And we want to counteract that misinformation. The movie is is not it's based on a true story, but of course there are some fictional parts to it. But what happened? I mean, the slave trade happened. It did uh, in 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 the country that it happened. It was good. that's just history, but that doesn't mean that there in the midst of all of that there weren't there wasn't some wonderful things happening. And one of those things was this wonderful group of women who were just absolutely amazing and how they uh, engaged in community in sisterhood and just uh, relentless fear, uh, uh, just courageous protection of their com their community and their, their country. So we're going to find a time. We, we don't know when that's going to be yet, but when we set the date, we'll let everybody know. It'll be, it won't be on a Wednesday night because we're going to do our regular night, but that'll be at a different time. So you all stay tuned for that. Pastor Yolanda, do you have any final announcements you want to share with us? You're muted. They say when you whisper, the devil can't hear you. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Brother Wayne. We invite a friend Sunday. Please join us Sunday at 10 a.m. and bring a couple of people with you. I wanted to end and share the same thought process that Jan Peterson had. I came on with a heavy heart. I was a little tired, but I'm so encouraged and so inspired. I share your sentiment, Jan. Um, I feel just a little bit better about being a Christian tonight. Wow. Wow. Thanks be to God. Folks, thank you all for tuning in. We look forward to being back with you on next Wednesday. On next Wednesday, Pastor Mark Hoover from New Spring Church will be with us specifically to talk about the importance of, so we're saying life groups, small groups. What we're really talking about, the importance of doing life with others, how important that is to growing as a Christian, how important that is to growing as a human being is doing life in community with others. So we look forward to that conversation. God bless you all. Have an amazing night and uh, an amazing rest of your week. Goodbye. <laughs>